guys. Um, welcome to the latest webinar in the Independent Gym series. Thank you for joining us. This is the 15th webinar we've done now. So um, yeah, rocking along nicely. Um, today we are joined by Thomas Stringwell. Thomas is the founder of Your Gym Sports Performance. Um, started up, uh, it's an education company specializing in sort of level four and sports uh, performance education. So not an average level two, level three qualifications. This is sort of more sort of specific high-end sort of um, focused education platform. Um, founded with some of the guys from your gym up in uh, Lytham St Anne's, I believe. If off to yeah. So um, started at the beginning, through, started during the pandemic, September 2020, um, and they're going to answer some big things. We've been having a quick chat before you guys all jumped in, um, and they're uh, sort of launching in Sweden and, and Australia. So um, some big things to come from these guys. Um, so Thomas Stringwell is going to be hosting. Uh, we'll do the usual Q&A at the end, so if you've got any questions, drop it through the chatter feature. And we are obviously recording this, so if you want to re-watch it, um, you can do. Um, so on that note, Thomas, over to you. Okay, so uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you for joining us today. Um, the aim of today, I want to introduce you guys to strength and conditioning in the field and what the aims are of a strength and conditioning coach and how this is relevant to people that are independent gym owners such as yourself. And my main aim is to always educate. So I want you guys to get some education from this and to learn from it and um, to gain some engagement and trust with you guys. And if you have any questions beyond that, then I'm more than happy to answer any questions. You guys will soon realize that I can speak about SNC and sports science um, all day, every day. So, First of all, um, a little bit about my background. I have worked within sports performance um, concurrently alongside teaching for over 15 years. I originally worked within professional rugby and then I worked within uh, professional football academies and then from there developed a consultancy business, which I still run um, alongside the education business. And the consultancy business is me working independently with sports clubs, athletes, uh, across a whole range of sports and embedding strength and conditioning within those environments. So at the moment I'm working with Atkinson Stanley Football Club and we are developing a long-term athletic development model across the club. Um, I've worked with MMA fighters, with boxers, and my personal sporting passions are strength sports. Um, I've competed in weightlifting and I compete in powerlifting. Um, so yeah, I provide performance consulting across the whole range, really. I, my, from an educational point of view, um, I did my UK SCA uh, accreditation and worked in uh, professional sport. I finished my um, sports science degree and I have a master's degree, which I did at Loughborough University within sports biomechanics. So the main aim of today's session is to introduce the objectives of the strength and conditioning coach and talk about how these two are related and talk a lot about the performance qualities that we look from athletes and talk about how this is applicable to both athletes and general populations alike. So the objectives of a strength and conditioning coach fundamentally is two factors. Yes, a strength and conditioning coach will do lots of jobs within their role, within a um, professional setting. They are required to gather data. They are required to analyze data. They are required to coach sessions, to um, monitor an athlete's wellness, etc. However, fundamentally, your KPIs as a strength and conditioning coach are to increase performance and prevent injury. So we're going to look at each of these qualities and then we're going to see how these two qualities are linked. And I'm going to give examples all the way through this presentation, how we can prevent injury through increasing performance. Um, and as always, um, uh, like Robert's just uh, informed if you guys have questions 
feel free to ask questions, feel free to put it into the live chat. I'm sure Robert will communicate it back to me. I'm more than happy to answer questions and speak to you guys privately or however, you know, you want to discuss whatever you want to discuss. So when we talk about increasing performance, what we mean is, is we increase the performance of the required performance qualities that are needed for that athlete's chosen sport. It is not your role as a strength and conditioning coach to make sure that your football team wins a game or to make sure that your athlete wins a race or one of your fighters wins a fight. That's their role. That's their role as an athlete. That's what they do. It is your role as a strength and conditioning coach to ensure that the required performance qualities needed for the athlete's chosen sport are improved. And by default, if I improve those athlete qualities, the overall result should be an increase in the actual sports performance on the field. So, for example, if you look at team sports, if you look at racket sports, all those sports involve the ability to strike something, a ball, an opponent, um, to apply force, to be able to do explosive, powerful movements, to be able to accelerate over short distances, to be able to change direction rapidly, to be able to do this under fatigue repeatedly. So all these qualities need to be identified, which we do through research. We'll look at the research and say, okay, so what are the required performance qualities of the sport? Identify those qualities, test the athlete on those qualities to see how well they can perform with each of those qualities, i.e. a power test, a strength test, a speed test. Look where the gap is, look what qualities need to be improved quickly, and then improve those qualities. So sports have these benchmarks. When I was working way back when we were in professional rugby, even then, rugby players were required to be able to perform a 10 meter sprint in under two seconds, regardless of position. You'd expect the wingers, the backs, the centers to be able to do it quicker, and maybe the guys in the scrum to be around two seconds, but either way, they are expected to be able to perform that. And it's when you see an 18 stone rugby player that can cover 10 meters in under two seconds that you realize and you're dealing with a very good athlete. So we identify the performance qualities, we test those qualities, we then introduce programs to improve those qualities. And then at the end of that process, we evaluate, well, how effective was that program? And we do that by retesting. So performance testing is a key factor within s &C. And then what we also look at is, well, during our time working with that athlete, did injuries occur? Now injuries will occur in sport. That's non-negotiable. Sport is very demanding. It demands that you perform certain biomechanical positions that aren't very biomechanically safe. It, it requires you to be to do a certain action repeated under fatigue. But some injuries can be prevented. And what we can do is identify the high risk factors associated with some injuries and then look to reduce those risk factors. And if we reduce those risk factors, we therefore reduce the chance of injury. So what I want to do is explain, first of all, what this graph represents and why I've chosen this graph to talk about the performance qualities of sport. Because a lot of the training that we do within the weight room with athletes, all of which a lot of you guys will do within your personal practice when you're working with general populations, because all this is relative. Um, I can remember when I first started working with in strength and conditioning, a strength and conditioning room, i.e. a room that contained platforms, bumper plates, Olympic barbells, a bit of turf down the middle for some sprint work, that stuff was behind the hidden curtain. It was behind the hidden curtain of performance. And now it is definitely fair to say that that curtain is being lifted. I imagine a lot of you guys have weightlifting platforms, bumper plates, barbells, um, speed agility based turf, plyometric boxes within your facilities. And I think with the advent of CrossFit especially, 
it demonstrated that a lot of general populations do like to train for performance. Regardless of whether they are playing sport or not, they like to be able to say, I have improved in this time, in this quality. I imagine a lot of you guys have coached general populations how to Olympic lift, how to strength train, how to perform plyometrics, even though they're not playing a sport. So for me, this is training. You know, performance training is training. So what we are looking at this force velocity curve, it underpins a lot of the stuff that we do in the weight, the weight room. So this research was originally done by Hill. And what he did, he tested how much force a muscle fiber can generate relative to how quickly that muscle fiber is shortening. So he compared muscle shortening velocity against how much force or how hard that muscle can, can contract. Well, what he found were, for you guys that have done a little bit of uh, mathematical space stuff, engineering, physics, etc. He found that the two had an inverse relationship. So this is what you call a hyperbolic curve. So what that means in English is essentially, as one goes up, the other comes down. So he found that a muscle fiber can produce the most force. And he, that's how he originally did his research. He tested individual muscle fibers. What he found were that a muscle fiber can produce the most force when it's moving or shortening at a very slow velocity. So if you look here on this graph, the high force is happening when the muscle shortening velocity is very low, almost isometric. So if we think about that from a training point of view, if you perform a one rep max, if I have you perform a one RM on a deadlift, for example, that rep will be performed at a slow speed. Now you will not do it purpose on a slow speed. You will try and lift that weight as quickly as possible. But the reason it is moving slow is because it's heavy. It's a heavy load. And for you to be able to overcome that load, you need to be able to apply a lot of force into the floor to overcome that weight. So Newtonian, Newtonian mechanics, which is what all motion, all movement is based on. You guys deal with Newtonian mechanics every day when you're coaching someone. If you've coached someone how to do an exercise, you've dealt with Newtonian mechanics. A weight has inertia. It has a reluctance to move. To be able to break that inertia, we need to be able to apply a force. We need to be able to generate force in the muscle and we also need to apply Newton's third law. Every action has an equal opposite reaction. So if I want to stand up from a squat, I push down into the floor very hard. If I push down, it sends me up. So if you're working with a client or an athlete in your facility, then you've got to be able to apply force to overcome the load that's on their back or in their hands or whatever exercise it is that they're doing. So why is that relative to sport? Well, if I need to accelerate, i.e. if I need to sprint, then I've got inertia. So I need to break inertia. I need to be able to push off the blocks. The studies clearly show a strong correlation between one rec max squat performance and 10 meter sprint performance. So all else being equal, if I've got two people that can accelerate exactly the same, the one that can squat more is going to be able to accelerate quicker. If I say F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. If I rearrange that, acceleration equals force divided by mass. That means I can improve that acceleration two ways. I can either increase how much force you're applying to the floor or reduce your mass. I've had that conversation with rugby players before. Look, you want to get quicker, but you're carrying excess timber that we don't need. Let's reduce that mass. Or let's increase how much force you can apply. If you need to collide with an opponent, i.e. within a game of rugby, you need to be able to produce a lot of force to be able to do it. If you need to be able to hit an object, hit a ball, you need to be able to apply more force. If you guys are working with runners, physics tells us, which is non-negotiable, 
if you apply more force into the floor, that person will run quicker. They will accelerate quicker. How can we improve how much force someone can apply into the floor through strength training? If you, if I improve your squat from 140 kilograms to 160 kilograms, I have improved how hard you can push into the floor because you can now overcome a bigger weight. Powerlifting is all about producing high force. With an endurance sport, you need to be able to apply repeated force under fatigue. So how many sports require the ability to accelerate, change direction, which is where you apply a large force, jump, where you apply a large force into the floor, strike an opponent, strike a ball? Nearly all of them. I've covered a big range of sport there. So strength training underpins a lot of what we do within strength and conditioning. The studies clearly show that a reduction, if we can, if we can prevent or reduce the effects of sarcopenia, so a muscle wastage as we age, then that person has a better quality of life because they can produce more force during everyday con, um, everyday tasks. I've, I've, I know powerlifters that are still in the seventies and can still deadlift two hundred kilograms. They will not need a stick to get out of a chair. They can produce enough force into the floor to stand up. They have a good quality of life. And I'm sure a lot of you guys promote this with your clients and your work in, within your independent gyms. And I personally think you guys that have got these independent gyms that are built for performance. There's no reason why you can't do consulting to work with people that compete in sports that could use your facilities. Local rugby teams, football teams, endurance space athletes. Sports that don't normally have independent SNC coaches, fighters, MMA fighters, triathletes. So all these people need to be able to apply for us. Now, what he also found at the other end of the curve, he found the opposite. If the muscle is shortening with a very quick velocity, it can't apply, it can't apply as much force because it's not got time. Now, why is that relevant to sport? Because when we are competing in sport, we are moving with high velocity. During a running cycle, the angular velocity at the knee is around 1,200 degrees per second. It moves very quickly. You've not got time to apply a lot of force. So we need to make sure we train at the other end of that curve. And that's where we look at plyometrics. So plyometrics is probably the most misunderstood forms of training. I'll explain why that is more later on, but um, it's a very effective training method. It allows us to move with high velocity rapidly. It increases what we call musculotendon stiffness. It allows the muscle and tendon to work as an effective spring and store and recoil energy. That's going to improve running economy. If you had a runner who did nothing else but did plyometrics three times a week, two exercises, five sets, five reps on each plyometric, with the right type of progression and coaching, they will increase their muscular tendon stiffness, which will improve their running economy. They can do more work with less energy, which is good for running performance. So all sport requires you to be able to produce high force and high velocity. So that means, that means as a coach, what we do, we have to surf this curve. We have to have the athlete perform at one end of the curve at certain times and the other end of the curve at different times, which is periodization. How you periodize that depends on the athlete, depends on their sport. Now, the middle part of the curve is interesting. So what is power? First of all, let's define power. Power is the rate of work. It's how much work you are doing within a space of time. So a vertical jump that is very high is powerful because an athlete has jumped very high. They've done a lot of mechanical work in a short space of time. If you look at an athlete doing a broad jump, the world record broad jump set by one of the combine athletes in American football is 12 foot three inches. 
map out 12 foot three inches and imagine doing that within one broad jump. That's a lot of work that has been done within a very short space of time. It probably took him around one second to complete the jump. Within one second, he's covered 12 foot three inches. General populations need the ability for power. Power is not just specific to athletes. You need power to get out of a chair. You need power to initiate any movement. How do we train for power? How do we get better at doing a lot of work in a short space of time? There's a few different tools we can use. One of them is Olympic weightlifting. Olympic weightlifting gets used in strength and conditioning because it improves how much power someone can generate. Now, the clause of that is, and I hate saying this because as a coach, I love weightlifting, but as a coach, we need to make sure that we're always careful of our bias. To get a good training effect on weightlifting, you need to be good at weightlifting. So I would say on that front, if you're going to implement weightlifting with an athlete, with a group of athletes, with youth athletes, which is, again, I work a lot with youth athletes, um, the evidence clearly shows that you can implement evidence-based training with youth athletes. Um, have a look at something called long-term athletic development, LTAD, which is what gets used in sports science. If you've coached a young athlete to be able to jump, to be able to land correctly, to be able to lift weights, then by the time they reach peak height velocity, which is the maximal height growth, um, which is around 12 to 13 for males, 10, 11 for females, they've got a lot of anabolic hormone. And if you've coached those movements right, you can progress those athletes. But it's got to be done correctly. So if you're working with an athlete that has been coached how to Olympic weightlifting from a very young age. By the time they get to this age, you can use it effectively. If not, I introduce it in the warm-ups. I get the athletes doing barbell work in the warm-up. So over the long term of a season, they can then perform Olympic lifts next season. Um, so Olympic weightlifting is one way we can improve power output. Olympic weightlifting is a, is a sport, is... Is a very powerful base sport. Another way we can do it is through loaded jumps, which is more popular quite often these days within certain sports because you might have an athlete that can't Olympic weightlift due to injuries. They might have impingements in the shoulder. They might have they might be quite battle hardened from what sport they've played. So loaded jumps is in a loaded squat jump or loaded hex bar jump. Again, is a great way of introducing power. Um, the numbers generally say around 20 to 40% of your one RM back squat, depending on how strong the person is. But just to put some numbers on that, if you weigh 100, if you can squat 100 kilograms, that means you're performing squat jumps with 40 kilograms on your back. Make sure you can perform a jump first without a bar on your back before you start attempting loaded jump. But we can use loaded jumps to improve power. And they're done for sets of three to five explosively. Very effective training. Another way we can improve power, which we've already talked about, is um, plyometrics. Plyometrics has been shown as a very effective method to improve power. Again, working with youth athletes, developing athletes, plyometrics can be introduced pretty quickly. Now, Joe Vekashansky, the godfather of plyometrics, he first formulated plyometrics in 1950s. He used to say, because of ground reaction forces, that you shouldn't be performing depth jumps, which is where you walk off a box of a metre to one and a half metres in height, land and then jump up again after, he said you shouldn't be performing those unless you can squat double body weight. Now, I wouldn't go that far because that's going to exclude a lot of people. But the main take on point from uh, his work were that you need to, athletes need to be able to be prepared to withstand the forces from landing. So let's just talk a little bit about that for a minute. Gravity pulls everything towards the floor at 9.81 meters per second per second because it's accelerating. 
Now, if you stood on the floor, it's not really relevant. Jump off a building, it becomes very relevant because the longer you're falling, the heavier you're getting. And it's also relevant when you're in locomotion, when you're moving. So even a general running pace, a general running pace, and I know that's a very general term by its nature, but at an easy running pace, at the point of heel strike, if you're a heel strike runner, you've got around two and a half to three times body weight of force going through the body per foot contact. And if you're running for a long time, that's a lot of foot contacts. And if it's on tarmac, it's not very compliant. So let's just think about that for a minute. If someone weighs 100 kilograms, that means per foot contacts, they have 300 kilograms of force going through their ankle, knee, hip, and then transferring through the spine. If you start to increase your running pace, those ground, ground reaction forces increase. They soon reach four or five times body weight. If you accelerate at a full sprint speed, that first foot contact is around 10 times body weight. The greatest recorded ever ground reaction forces within sports are the last impact strike before a long jumper or triple jumper performs a long jump or triple jump. And the studies show that that, was, that ground contact is around 18 times body weight. So that's 18 times body weight of force. 18 times body weight of force striking the floor as you go and perform your jump, which is a hell of a lot. It's massive. So we need to prepare athletes for those forces. So if you're working with a young athlete who was playing football or rugby or hockey or netball, gravity doesn't care how old you are. It's the same. So if you are into, if you are having to undergo those sort of ground reaction forces all the time, then you need to prepare athletes for it. Now, if you are performing box jumps, if you walk off a box of a meter height, or a meter in height, 1.5 meters in height, at the point of landing, your ground contact reaction force is somewhere around eight, nine, ten times body weight. So we should be doing a bit of preparation with the people that we are working with as coaches before we have them start jumping off boxes of certain heights. I would say you've got two options. You, you either make sure the athlete's got a good strength training background you're working with, or they've been doing a plyometric-based sport for a long time, which is ideally the best one. So let's just talk a little about, about the other quality that's mentioned there, rate of force development. You could argue this is the difference between the good and the great in sport. How much force you can apply in a quick space of time how much force you can apply within a short time scale, which is rate of force development. So what you're looking at there is a what you call a force time graph, where someone's ground reaction force has been measured whilst they are performing a jump. And it starts off at around 700 newtons of force because obviously that's their weight, mass, times 9.81, gravity. Because that's your weight. Your mass is just your mass. That's just 70, 80 kilograms. Your weight is that times gravity. And then as they push into the floor to perform their jump, the ground reaction force increases until it reaches a peak, which will be the point where their toe leaves the floor. So if we can increase how steep that graph is, that means you can produce more force in a short space of time. Now let's think about sport. If you strike the floor when you are running, your ground contact times are around 100 to 200 milliseconds. So you've got 100 to 200 milliseconds to apply force. If you strike an opponent, the contact time is minimal. If you strike a football, a tennis ball, Again, the actual contact time is very reduced. So if we can produce more force within that very short time window, we are going to perform better. 
How many times have you heard someone say, I'm trying to improve my golf performance and I'm having some golf lessons. I'm, going, I'm having lessons to improve my swing. If I can improve how much torque you can generate at your shoulder and throughout your body, I will improve how well you can drive that ball. Hence the reason why s and within golf is a big thing now. So we can improve rate of force development. Again, through weightlifting, plyometrics, loaded jumps. So now let's look at how a lot of this is related to injury prevention. Now, before we even explain what this graph means, if an athlete is stronger, they are more robust to injury. So that means when the sport demands that they go into certain positions, when a scrum collapses, when they have to make a change of direction that was unplanned, the stronger that that athlete is in the first place, the more robust they are to injury. Having working, worked within football, there are far too many ACL ruptures within football. A lot of them could be prevented for increasing someone's eccentric hamstring strength. Because we know a strong correlation between eccentric hamstring strength and ACL ruptures. If more footballers did Nordics, glute ham raises, stiff-legged deadlifts, there would be less ACL ruptures within that sport. The stronger an athlete is, the more robust they are to injury. So this study highlights this perfectly. Now what they did within this study, they measured how much concentric and eccentric force people could generate within their knee extensors, so their quadriceps. And they compared general populations to elite high jumpers. And they used a piece of equipment called an isokinetic dynamometer. Sounds really fancy. All it is is essentially a leg extension that moves to a set speed. And it's got a piece of kit in the end that measures how hard you can push up against the pad. And it's got the same sensor that measures how hard you can resist it coming down. It measures eccentric force that way. But what they found there is that the high jumpers had far greater eccentric strength compared to the non-high jumpers. Well, high jumping is plyometric in nature by its name. It involves jumps. Plyometrics is a rapid eccentric contraction when you land. Think about plyometrics as eccentric training. So what they found there in this study is that the elite high jumpers, their eccentric strength was around 150% of the greatest concentric. And if any of you guys have ever done some eccentric training with well, adjustable hooks, weight releases, this type of stuff, you will know that you should be able to lower a weight that you can't lift concentrically. It's actually a very effective way for improving strength. It's just very demanding. But what they found there with the non-high jumpers is that the eccentric strength was actually less than the concentric. Now let's just think about that from an injury prevention point of view. That would mean that if these non-high jump group were performing jumps off a box of a meter in height, or they were running at a quick speed, all of which involve a rapid eccentric contraction at the point of ground contact, they weren't producing enough eccentric strength within the muscle to cope with it. But that force is still going through the body regardless. So if the muscles aren't distributing that force effectively, then the skeletal structures instead have to take up the flak, which means you've now got massive compressive and shear forces going through the Achilles tendon, through the ligaments, the, the knee joint, the ACL, now, a follow-up study to this was 
that they got the same group of general populations. They put them through a 12-week plyometric program. And what they found at the end of it, their eccentric strength had improved. So they had prevented injury. Potentially. Now, you can't measure concentric, eccentric strength in your gym, but a good take-home to take away from this, guys, is that if you are working with anyone that wants to improve running performance, whether it's recreational, general populations, an athlete or whatever, the studies show that you need a good ratio of eccentric hamstring strength to concentric quad strength. So what does that mean from a programming point of view? It means that for every squat-based movement you've got within your programs, you need to make sure you've got an equal amount of stiff-legged deadlifts, good mornings, Nordics, create some bulletproof hamstrings. So how can we prevent injury within sports performance? People often think injury prevention is all about mobility work, stretching, which is all important. However, the take-home message from this is, is that we can prevent injury through increasing performance. If I improve your eccentric hamstring strength, I prevent or reduce the risk of an ACL injury. If I increase your single leg strength, I reduce the risk of a lateral ankle sprain. I've worked with athletes who initially can't perform a barbell split squat with 40 kilograms on the back, but yet they're a paid sportsman. How the hell can you expect someone to apply a lot of force on the floor through one leg if you can't even do a barbell back squat without being unstable? If we increase how much torque we can produce at the shoulder, we reduce shoulder injuries. If we increase how much co-contraction we can develop around the torso, we increase lumbar pelvic control, we prevent back injuries. What's the best way to prevent a back injury? To grow some back muscle. What's the best way to prevent a knee injury? To grow some muscles around the knee. So we can improve performance and at the same time, we can prevent injury through increasing performance. So overall, what does that strength and conditioning role look like? What does the strength and conditioning coach do? As an overall, the role of the strength and conditioning coach is this, the overall process. You identify the required performance qualities needed in that athlete's chosen sport. Do they need to be powerful? Do they need strength? Do they need the ability to perform sprints? Normally, yes. Do they do repeated sprints under fatigue? Again, normally, yes. What we then do is say, okay, so we've identified these performance qualities. Now let's assess those required performance qualities. We measure their vertical jump for power. We measure their lower body strength for a one RM squat or deadlift. We measure their upper body strength. We measure their sprint times. We normally do some form of anaerobic test like repeated sprint performance, which is as horrible as it sounds. Repeated and sprints are two words that shouldn't be mixed. But sport demands it. We enhance the required performance qualities. We identify what those performance qualities are and we improve those performance qualities. Now, you guys might have worked with someone or you might know someone that is very good at one type of sport. And what you'll generally find is with a little bit of coaching, they are very good at other sports. They pick up on the other sports quickly. They have the required performance qualities already. If you look at a weightlifter celebrate a lift, if you watch them perform a vertical jump as they cheer in the air, they go into orbit. They are very good at producing power. 
So we identify the performance qualities, assess those performance qualities, and then write the programs to improve those performance qualities. And this is where we program Olympic lifts, plyometrics, loaded jumps, strength training, sprint work. I'm sure some of you guys do that already with the general populations that might come to your gym. Why can't we train those people the same? What we then do is identify what we call the epidemiology of the sport. So in other words, what injuries are common within that athlete's chosen sport? Once we've identified that, those risk factors, we say, okay, so what are the risk factors associated with those injuries? As an example, we know there's a strong correlation between knee valgus and ACL rupture. If someone is running with a knee valgus, they are primed for an ACL rupture. So we've got to think about, okay, well, let's reduce that knee valgus. Let's make sure that the hip abductors, external rotators are contracting at the point of ground contact. They've got good hip stability and therefore they are moving correctly. And then we look at preventing injury through increasing performance. If I make my athletes stronger, and again, if you make a, general, a member of general populations stronger, you improve their athlete robustness to injury. You make them more powerful. We make sure they're moving correctly. And then what we do, we assess and evaluate. If you're not assessing, you're guessing. How do I know that someone's improving if I'm not assessing performance? Like I said at the right at the start of this process, I'm sure some of you guys have blackboards on your in your gyms where you've got a little bit of a time, a bit of a table, a leaderboard of a challenge that is happening. And you will get grown adults from all sorts of backgrounds that can't wait to rub someone's name off and write their time on the top. People like to train for this sort of performance and to see performance improvement qualities. So we can assess that and say, okay, was that effective? Do we need to change something? We put a program together. At the end of it, we assess, was it effective? If it was, brilliant. If not, we need to reevaluate and do something different. Now, I've been in situations as an SNC coach where you are literally, you are judged on that as your KPIs. Have my athletes got quicker, faster, stronger? If they have, brilliant, you've done your job. If not, you're sacked. Go and find a new position. So, again, I know Robert's got the function for you guys to ask questions. Please make sure you do ask questions. And if you had any questions, you want to speak to me directly, that would be fine. I hope you've enjoyed that bit of an input. What I want to do now with you guys is just explain a little bit about what courses we do um, and how we are working with Independent Gyms UK and give you guys a bit of an explanation of what our courses entail. So we currently offer a foundational course, which is a online course, and it is a introduction to strength and conditioning. Purely as an introduction, and it acts as a bit of a halfway house between personal training and level four strength and conditioning. Now, if you already work with strength training, Olympic weightlifting, plyometrics, you might not need that, but we offer that as a way to bridge the gap. Our main flagship course is our level four strength and conditioning educational pathway. So this is a five day practical course and over those five days, we cover Olympic weightlifting. So we cover full breakdown of the snatch, clean and jerk. We cover loaded jumps. We cover plyometric training for vertical propulsion, horizontal, multidirectional. We cover speed and agility for acceleration, for deacceleration and braking, for change of direction, for maximal sprint performance. 
We cover strength, endurance, and power endurance, which again is two words that should not be put together, but we do have to put them together because in sport, you are required to perform repeated powerful and strength movements under fatigue. So we talk about barbell complexes, cluster training, of which we get you guys doing. We use contrast training, barbell complexes. You guys also do some maximal aerobic speed work and you do some repeated spinability. And at the end of that, you are assessed on your performance as a coach to be able to coach one of the Olympic lifts and to be able to coach a speed, agility and plyometric based workout. Beyond those five days, you then get access to a online learning journey, which is over 20 modules in depth, each one with a supporting video lecture and content. And you are required to take someone through the strength and conditioning process. So you actually strength and conditioning a recreational athlete, a participant that you can use, and you take them through that SNC process over 12 weeks. And at the end of it, all that is submitted. And then you also need to pass a online theory exam. Now we roll those practical days out across. We do that. We schedule the courses in Livingham at your gym. We do them in Birmingham and we do them in London. And they are scheduled geographically um, across those venues um, over this next year, over this year and next. And through uh, Independent Gyms UK, we offer Independent Gym members a discount on our Level 4 Strength and Conditioning course. Uh, and it is a reduction of £250. So rather than the course being £1,500, it's £1,250. Now, at the moment, we are doing online, we are doing lockdown learning. We've got cohorts that started the course that couldn't actually attend the practical days because the world closed, as you guys know. So I've been teaching groups via uh, Zoom, via virtual means, via um, weekly Zoom meetings during this lockdown period. We've just started one in January. We started one in February. And we're about to start one again this month, which is me taking the group through weekly lectures around an hour in length that underpins all the strength and conditioning components of the course. So if any of, if anyone's interested, if any of you guys are interested in finding out more information about our level four, then you can contact the guys who Rob, or you can contact myself in a minute when I put my details up and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Now, we have recently done bespoke courses with Accrington Stanley Football Club for their coaches, and we're about to do one at Wimbledon um, FC Foundation. And that is where they've got a number of staff members that want to run through our course, and we can teach that in-house. And again, if you guys had multiple staff members that were interested in doing something similar to that, then I'd be more than happy to discuss it. And then finally, we are always looking for venues to host our courses. Like I said, geographically, we are running courses in Livingham, Birmingham and London. However, as we collect data from interest, if it becomes apparent that we need to look at doing courses in different parts of the country, we are going to be looking for venues to where we can host courses, of which obviously we would pay a day higher. And over five days, that can accumulate um, to a venue higher. So again, if, if anyone would be interested in us using their facility, feel free to get in touch and I'll be happy to discuss it further. Um, recently, what we also did was a sports injury science webinar series, which was a five-part webinar series that covered um, the science of injuries what causes injuries and how we can prevent injuries. And we covered lateral ankle sprains, Achilles tendonitis, patellofemoral pain, IT band syndrome, ACL ruptures, spinal injuries, shoulder injuries. 
the entire series is £25 and it's five webinars, each one around an hour in length, discussing in detail those injuries. Now, that's not accessible via the website, um, but it's a private area in the website and it's an exclusive page and I can essentially give access to it and then that's how that's purchased. So again, if any of you guys would be interested in listening or finding out more about our Sports and New Science webinar series, feel free to get in touch and I'll be happy to provide some more information. So I hope you've found all this interesting, guys. I hope you've found uh, the presentation interesting. I hope you've... Um, I hope it's been a bit of an introduction to strength and conditioning and what SNC is all about and what we do as SNC coaches. These are my contact details. If you guys would like uh, to contact me, or I'm sure if not, you could contact me via um, Rob at um, Independent Gyms. Um, again, we can be found through all the normal streams. Um, our website is free to subscribe to. And we've on our website, we have numerous coaching resources. So we have an exercise library, which covers Olympic weightlifting, plyometrics, strength training, speed agility. We have coaching resources such as a 1RM calculator and a 1RM estimator. We have um, vlogs, video articles, um, the video articles, some around 10 minutes in length, covering a specific subject. We have previous webinars that we've done on the website there as well. And I created that website as a, a reliable place that coaches can come back to to find out some good quality information, which is the reason why we did it. So, again, I hope you guys have found this interesting. And feel free to please contact me if you have any further questions, even about strength and condition, as you've probably gathered, I can talk a lot about strength and conditioning. So if you want, if you want to know some more information, then uh, feel free to contact me. Brilliant, Thomas. I think, um, yeah, you, you, you're right there. There's a lot of information that you, you've got in, in that brain of yours. So um, useful stuff. Uh, I thought it was, it was really fascinating. I'm, I'm not a... I won't say I'm an exercise background. My, my background in the industry has always been management and sales and so on. I've always sat on that side of the fence, but just hearing some of the stuff, kind of um, a bit of a layman's terms for me, I suppose. I mean, my first thoughts were strength and conditioning is all about lifting weights, but it, it, it's not, is it, by the sound of it? It's a lot more to it than that. So um, yeah. other than weightlifting, what are the sort of the main sort of elements that you'd wrap up into the SNC sort of field? Yeah, so it's... With with what what a lot of sport now uses is um, GPS data. Believe it or not, the, the the guys used to call them lie detectors. So it's literally a little black chip. You wear it on as within like a sports bra, and at the end of the game, it tells you how far you've run, how many sprints you did, what distance you did, um, and that sort of information has really allowed us as coaches to say right, what are the qualities that's needed. So. Premiership footballers will cover on average around 9.5 kilometres per game, which is a lot of repeated sprinting. Um, so we say, okay, so what do we need to do as coaches? We need to we need to improve the movement qualities that that sport requires. So we need to improve sprints, sprint performance, running performance, how well someone can change direction. Bound, bound mechanically efficiently without causing injury, how well they can break, how well they can jump. Um, so weight, like you said, people, people often associate weightlifting and strength training with S&C, but in reality, that's just one of the tools that we use. You know, we've, we use, and you might be working with an athlete that can't Olympic lift. I've worked with rugby players that have got pins in shoulders and herniated discs and they can't perform these movements, but what you can do is improve the performance somehow. You know, mm. you've, you've got to, you've got to find the solution. Um, and it's interesting you talk about management from an S and C point of view. Like the work I did at Accrington Stanley Football Club, when we embedded uh, long-term athletic development at the club, that was more about Excel spreadsheets. 
it wasn't me coaching someone how to perform a squat. It was more about embedding the systems at the club of how they can run S and C across all the academy academy age groups right through to the first time. So it, be, it becomes more about uh, data analysis, embedding systems, how you're going to test operational systems. Um, when you're first working in s &C, it's a baptism of fire within Excel, definitely. You know? so, so you mentioned some of the teams you work with. In, in terms of um, like adoption from the people you work with, who who is more open to the sort of the processes that you go through? Is it the, the professional teams and those the team-based sports, or is it with the, the average Joe in the gym that you work with? A combination of both. I have within football, it is very club specific. You will go to some clubs where is there is just a culture of SNC, a culture of sports performance. You will go to other clubs, which I'll not name, but you know, they think you get better at football through kickups. Mm. Um, whereas in professional rugby, S and C is just part of the foundation of of performance. Working with individual athletes, it, and again, it's very sport specific. Working with competitive fighters, I've generally found that with the nature of their sport, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, they, they, they pull a poker face all the time. So, you know, you could say to the guys, right, today we're jumping off a cliff and they'll say, where's the cliff and how many times? Without any sort of thought, you know, they will train this off into the ground, which is great. But what we need to do is manage it. Because I've worked with fighters that are training a.m., p.m. and then working eight hours in between. And they're doing it five and six days a week. Uh, and getting paid very little for it until they make it further up. So mm. it's, it's very sport-specific. So youth athletes, some of the best athletes I've ever worked with have been youth athletes because they're like little robots. They'll just do what, you know, they'll do what they're told. Um, you've obviously just got to change the training a little bit depending on not so much their chronicle age, their biological age and their maturity. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you're working with a young lad... A young, a young male athlete, he'll still be pretending to be a Power Ranger in between sets. You know, <laughs> you know, it all depends on what age group and whereabouts they're at. Yeah, yeah, great. I'll mix in one of the questions from Colin, who's listening in. Um, tipping into the the pro athletes, you mentioned about being able to target and attract professional athletes and teams who don't have specific S and C coaches. Have you got any advice on ways to go about? seeking out those opportunities how would you go about it if you had nothing yourself so i think the the first key thing is network the first key thing is networking is to think about your immediate network and think about who you know that is currently active in sport and then look at okay what sports am i familiar with what sports have i got contacts with within that immediate network and then it's it's, it's a case of well, I would normally say knocking on doors, but obviously at the moment we've been restricted with that. But you will generally find that sports coaches, clubs, etc., are very face-to-face. -face. They want a bit of a more of an old school chat. Um, and it's about just it's like it's just like personal training. It's do do a very good, honest job in the first place when you do manage to get the opportunity. And then from that, you build a reputation. So I would say immediate sports that aren't so much known for having strength and conditioning, they need to find it. Combat sports are very good because those guys need strength and conditioning coaches, but quite often they'll not utilise strength and conditioning coaches because they'll just use their fight coach for their sport, which introduces boxing, MMA, MMA. Um, if you know some fighters, brilliant. If not, Put yourself in the deep end, go to those clubs and speak to the guys directly, which is a baptism of fire. But if you know you practice and you can pitch good enough and just think about the audience. I mean, obviously today I've talked a lot about science, but if I can say to a fighter, if I improve how hard you can push, such as in a bench press, I'll improve how hard you can punch. It's a clear enough language that speaks to the people. Um you might find yourself doing presentations, 
presenting to a bit of an audience. I think running clubs are a great sport you can tap into. Triathletes are a great sport you can tap into. Facilities itself, if you guys have got facilities, you might be able to speak to local clubs, rugby clubs, again, if you know someone, about actually just using your facilities as a strength and conditioning gym. I've worked with championship rugby teams, so one division below the premiership, rugby union, and they've been having to get contracts with local commercial gyms so they can come and train. So you imagine you've got 40 rugby players all built like a house that just invade a commercial gym every day. Um, I think those guys would be a lot more well suited to a independent gym that looks more like, you know, bumper plates, platforms, turf. It's going yeah. to be better for those guys to use it. So hopefully that answers your question. But again, if you ever want to get in touch, I'm more than happy to up. Sounds good. There's um, another question from Colin, and I've got a similar question. So Colin's talking from a coach perspective. What are some of the, the biggest mistakes that you see coaches make when they're when they're delivering S and C sessions or similar? And then on the flip side, from a facility perspective, what sort of kit do you see thrown into an S and C area that's just either not needed, pointless, or stuff that you don't see? So, so the mistakes from a coach perspective, and the mistakes from a facilities perspective. So from a coach perspective, is often, and again, this is what I this is why I personally think that someone that has personal trained that then makes a switch into S and C, in my opinion, often has an advantage because they know how to they know people skills and they know how to communicate with people. Um, I've worked in S and C where we've had an intern that's come straight from a degree or master's degree. And they've been pulled apart because they've got zero personality. Um, now, from their coaching point of view, from mistakes, and I've been guilty of this when I first started working in s &C, it's not appreciating that not all athletes work the same, tick the same. I've worked with athletes that are very introvert. You know, they'll not speak a lot. They'll not get really over... Um, stimulated before competition, but when they get onto the field, they switch on and they perform. And then likewise, I've worked with athletes where they are very extroverted. Um, and that can be difficult sometimes in a team sport environment because obviously you've got a mixture. You know, you've got the guys that are loud and brash and you've got the other guys that like to keep themselves to themselves and that type of stuff will put them off. So, Probably the biggest mistake you find is, is trying to coach everyone the same. Trying to coach everyone the same when not everyone needs to be coached the same. And it's about finding that happy balance. Sometimes the best thing you can do as a coach um, is let the athlete answer their own questions. I've had athletes say to me after a set, how was that set? And I've said, you tell me. And they'll say, well, I thought the first rep was good. The second one could have been that better and the third wasn't too bad. And the immediate question is, well, why do you think why do you think that? And they'll say, because of X, Y, and Z. And then you say, so what are you going to do on your next set? X, Y, and Z. Okay, do it. Now, in reality, you've not said anything. All you've done is sit back and coach. You let them work it out. You know, it's like when you are practicing a skill. And sometimes you we all do this for whatever sport we play. You just know if you've hit something right, if you've hit a golf ball right, if you've kicked a football right, you think that's a good shot. You know, that was a good rep. Um, and it's about creating that independence so athletes know that independence. So, yeah, it, probably what I often find is coaches trying to be too direct sometimes. A lot of s and is negotiation. A lot of it is negotiation. Ice baths. I hate ice baths. I find them a horrible experience. I've worked with athletes that love them and I've worked with athletes that hate them. Now, the studies are quite conflicting as to whether they're very, very beneficial or not. But if I've got an athlete who has undergone a massive stress, so within professional rugby, the collisions are about the same as a motorway car crash, biomechanically. If you've got two 18-stone players hitting each other, that's a lot of force. And 
they might have 10 or 15 a game. So that's 10 or 15 motorway car crashes in 80 minutes. This is why normally on a Sunday, a rugby player is completely written off. And on a Monday, they're coming back to earth. Well, if they're going through all that trauma, but then on a Monday morning, I'm going to start convincing that athlete that what they need to do is start squatting 90% of one of their one RM. If they find an ice bath very beneficial, I'll say crack on and have one, you know? I'll let them buy into it a little bit. So the other key thing you often find as a mistake from a coaching point of view is having to learn those negotiation skills um, of how athletes tick and what's going to allow them to work. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. So from an equipment perspective, I'll, I'll change the question slightly. What would be your ideal setup from an SNC perspective? What We talk about bumpers, plates, squat racks, lift platforms or something, but what would you put in your facility if you had a choice? Bear in mind you're connected to your gym and they might want to describe them. <laughs> well, honestly, I, I mean, I, I'll openly tell Andrew, Andrew this and Rob this, that they've got, <laughs> they've got too much stuff in there that you don't need for SNC. For what the list that you just listed for me is what you need yeah. fundamentally because you can prepare athletes across a whole range of sports with that, that equipment. Um, and we all know, I mean, that equipment is not cheap. You know, a platform and barbells and bumper plates and turf, that stuff, it's not cheap. I mean, there is some, malicious, some little additional equipment that I like, glue hand raises. Um, uh, something that or uh, something that you can perform a, a glute ham raise on, um, so you can perform extensions on it, etc. is always good. But if not, you can do a bod job. You know, you can hold someone's feet whilst they're on the bench. Going back to that example I said previously, um, my first strength conditioning role within Championship Rugby. A lot of Championship Rugby is rugby on a budget. So even though the professional sportsmen, things are on a budget. So I used to work at the Rotherham Titans at the time who we were a championship team and they actually got to the premiership for a season. Um, and we used to use ice baths. We used to use wheelie bins for ice baths. So the guys would be often be seen sat in a, in a wheelie bin in the car park um, for an ice bath. You know, you use what you can. So for me, barbells, as long as you've got Olympic bars, good quality bars that aren't going to bend, good quality bumper plates that are going to last. You've got platforms. You've got a bit of space to do work. Mm -hmm. Regarding plyometric boxes, I'm not a big fan of the soft boxes that wobble upon landing. Yeah. Plyometric boxes were meant to be wooden, sturdy boxes. Um, and I've had athletes say, but what happens if I don't jump onto it? I say, well, it'll hurt, so make sure you jump onto it. Um, <laughs> it's a solid surface and it should be a solid surface yeah. uh, and if anything really I'd say probably say something that's going to be important for us to see maybe is more space yeah. you know the more space to actually all to perform speed agility work etc but it doesn't need to be fancy stuff if you've got you know you've got platforms barbells bumper plates if you've got I imagine battle ropes you know, sleds, yeah. then you can you can make it make a very good athlete. I, I always say as an example, think about where this stuff comes from. It comes from 1950s Soviet Union, and they certainly didn't have the fanciest new kit. You know, if you look at those old pictures of a gymnasium, it looks essentially like a gymnastics room, like what I had at school at PE, rope yeah. ladders wooden beams, a bit of a wooden floor, and then some bumper plates knocking around. So if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Although I'd like to sell you a bit more kit, obviously. Um, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, I've really enjoyed that, Thomas. It's been, um, it's been great, for, I say, from my side, not, not an, an exercise background as such, really listening in some... Um, some of the finer points around strength and conditioning so really appreciate you jumping on and hosting today we'll get this posted up in the group this afternoon this evening so if there's any questions we'll have the contact details here as well and we'll get the guys to reach out to you but really appreciate you jumping on board and, uh, and hosting so thank you very much guys thank you it's been a pleasure for you to have me it's been really good thank you cheers buddy bye-bye